brief portion of a passage of scripture in the gospel of Luke, Luke's gospel, the 15th chapter beginning at the 11th verse. Well, hello, first lady. Hello. <laughs> You're looking quite snazzy thank tonight. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Amen. Glad to have you here with us. All the cover girls make some noise. Don't you have a... Don't we have an amazing leading lady here? Amen. Amen. Luke chapter 15, verse number 11. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, and he set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. And after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. And he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate what a story well, well, well church the I like to begin by articulating that the family has always held a very critical and significant place in God's program and plan for the earth family is so central to what God desperately desires to do in the earth, that the first of his prized creation, Adam, was designated as incomplete until God brought him an Eve and gave them the assignment to be fruitful and multiply. I want you to see how significant it is. If, if you look at the creation narrative, meaning the narrative, the story that details creation, the created order, creation as we know it in the book of Genesis, you'll see an order. You'll see God creating on the first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, the sixth day. We don't know if that's literal. We don't know if that's a metaphor for a period of time. But this is what I want you to see. After he created, he stepped back evaluated what he created on each day and he said it was good mm -hmm. until the sixth day when he created Adam he evaluated what he created and then said it's not good for man to be alone mm -hmm. that I cannot accomplish what I intended to accomplish in the earth if the male species is the only species that exists right. you got me so he says, because of this, I need to create a helper. So he creates Eve, right? He brings them together and then gives them this assignment. Be fruitful and multiply. That's right. Somebody say family. 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 As family goes, so goes culture. As family goes, so goes God's program in the earth. Family has always been a priority and God has had a divine expectation that it would always be a priority for us. It has always been a priority for him, and it is God's expectation that it would always be a priority for us. In God's eyes, 
family matters. However, because family matters to God, it also matters to Satan. I'm going to say it again. What matters to the eternal matters to the enemy. What matters to the divine matters to the devil. And if something is a priority for God's blessing, you better believe Satan will make it a priority for his attack. The enemy only attacks the important. And the area he attacks us in the most is the area he desperately wants to prohibit us from prospering in. Your area of greatest attack is the area that's going to bring the greatest breakthrough in your life because the enemy only attacks the important. Notice in the Garden of Eden, he didn't come for the giraffes. He didn't come for the dogs. He didn't come from the, for the lions. He came for Adam and Eve. Did he not? Because he felt like if I can disrupt this family unit, then I can disrupt what God desires to do in and through the earth. And so as a result of Adam and Eve's activity, now all families are affected by imperfection. That's right. Is that right? Yeah. So now, because family matters, we all have to deal with some family matters. Because family matters, it was attacked by the enemy. And as a result of that attack, all families now are affected by imperfections. So there are no perfect families because there are no perfect people. Are you hearing me? So how now, how now, how now can we make the best out of what will inevitably and ultimately be imperfect? We've got to deal with family matters. And all throughout scripture, people had to deal with family matters. The first family had to deal with family matters. Cain and Abel had sibling rivalry. Cain and Abel were Adam and Eve's children. And Abel gets done, well, he gets done in. <laughs> he gets bodied, <laughs> right, by his own brother. And watch this, the brother does it outside the presence of the parents. Because if the parents would have observed it, they would have intervened. And sometimes in family matters, you got people in, your own, in our own families at times that will throw the rock but hide their hand. Does that make sense? And then when you react or res when one reacts or responds to the activity they engaged in, your reaction is in public to what they did in private. And people start drawing conclusions about the appropriateness of your activity when they didn't see what Cain did, they just saw your response. Noah got drunk, a drunken stupor. Cost us, <laughs> and watch this. Uh, we all have some Noahs. I don't know anybody in this room who doesn't have a Noah in their, in their family. Come on, y'all just came from Thanksgiving. Yet some of y'all were just, he was, he was like, Lord, okay, there go Noah. It's time to go, Noah. How many is that, Noah? How many? <laughs> so you got Noah who's, who gets so drunk, he uncovers himself, and then you have someone in the family, his actual son, Ham, who actually takes what happened and spreads it publicly. Because we got, some have Noah's in their family, some have Ham's in their family. Who take matters that should be private, public. Abraham and Sarah had challenges with a blended family. Um, Isaac and Rebecca showed blatant favoritism toward their children. And it produced hostility between Jacob and Esau. 
Jacob perpetuated the pattern himself because he was favored by his mother. When he had a son named Joseph, he favored Joseph blatantly, gave him a coat and didn't give the other kids any coat. And it created jealousy and hostility between the brothers. David's father didn't even think enough of him. When Samuel went to Jesse's house to find the king, David's father didn't think enough of him to invite David to the meeting. What do you do when the one who ra who's raising you doesn't believe in you? Right? You had, then David, you have David who has a daughter. He grows up in a dysfunctional home. He has a daughter, right? Tamar. There's molestation that takes place. David, it is brought to David's attention. And he refuses to deal with it. So another one of his sons, and we know, we know that happens. That's the reality. Sometimes it's not the father. Sometimes it's the mother. It's... Blind eyes are turned toward Tamar-like situations. Think about this. All of these incidents are present in the pages of Scripture to assist us in understanding that the challenges we experience may not be as abnormal as we're assuming. All of this is in the, those things are written aforetime time are written for our learning, the Bible says. So all of these principles, all these principles are contained in Scripture to help us understand that our challenges may not be as abnormal as we are assuming. Therefore, we must all be equipped with biblical wisdom on how to navigate the maze of imperfect families because if you're waiting on it to be perfect in order for it to be good you'll be waiting until heaven I love the way God evaluate created and evaluated the earth and the words he used after he created the earth he didn't say it was perfect even though it was he called the perfect thing good Y'all follow me? And so this particular passage here, uh, this particular passage here in Luke 15, I think is a passage that can aid and assist us on navigating through some of these dynamics. Um, First Lady, we see here, although the theme in Luke 15 is about a parental relationship, it I think it applies to every aspect of the family. Because what happened with the father and son here can happen with brothers and sisters. It can happen with husbands and wives. You have two different kids who come from the same house who live two totally different lives. Does that make sense? So there, we read about one son in the parable. But if we, kept, if we had kept reading, there was another son who didn't go out. He didn't do anything crazy. He's raised in the same house, has the same father, ate the same Cheerios. But when they both get older, they take two different paths. What is God trying to teach us through this? He's trying to teach us, First Lady, the reality of your limitations. Because sometimes when families go awry or children go astray or uh, spouses go astray, we can automatically begin to assume I am responsible for what someone else has done. And this text shows us that that cannot be the case because you've got two boys in the same home and one makes one set of decisions and another makes a completely different set of decisions. It's trying to teach us the power of limitation. First lady, jump in here on that. So um, I think that's good. It definitely teaches us about uniqueness because as parents, we can see we have two boys as well. And a lot, 
I see a lot of times parents will fault themselves and say, well, I don't know what I did with this child, but with the other child, I did something right. Whereas if you both raise them the same way, it's because of their individuality. Everyone is unique. So our parents raised us a certain way, but that does not mean that they did something right or did something wrong. I can make, I can be raised in the same household as this person, but because of my, I make my own choices, my own decisions. And so because of my uniqueness, then I walk in that. And so we should make sure that we don't hold ourselves accountable for what we've done. We do our part, we raise our children, and then it's up to them to do their part. And that applies not just to children. Right. Because we're still navigating through this children thing. Yes. Still trying to figure that out. Right, but it applies to relationships. But it applies to... Yeah. Right, and that's why we want to talk about family. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, we're figuring, yeah. But it applies to every it level does. of relationship, every right? Relationship. Sometimes yeah. it's with cousins, it's with aunts, it's with yeah. uncles. Yes, we do things, we, we have influence, right. but we don't have control. Mm -mm. God, even God himself, right. does not impose his will on us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that the truth now? Right. Even God himself does not violate free will. So if God cannot influence me, now nobody's better to us than God. Right. And we still don't manage that relationship the way we should. Right. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. Why? Because, because of what lady said, because of our uniqueness, because of our individuality. Right. And so if that is the case with us, and God, then that's also the case with us and our spouses. Yes, we can contribute, but you can't cause. No. No. You can contribute, but you, you don't cause. Whenever anyone makes any kind of decision, right. they made that decision. Yes, that's right. We can create conditions, yes. but others make their own decisions. That's right. And, and I'm telling you, if, if we can get that revelation, if we can get that revelation, you're talking about freeing the liberty you'll be able to walk in will be unprecedented because you have made, you have drawn the line of demarcation between what God does, what I do, and what others are responsible for. And so people are mm -hmm. unique, but I, it's, you said something else too. So everyone is unique, but then there's also influences. So even about the people that's around them. That's so the children could be around and, and I remember growing up I used to always get mad when my mom would say okay what's they pay where who are their parents where they work I'm like why you want to know everything about them and their parents but I understood because they have been raised in a certain home and if they're talking to me about certain things then I'm being influenced so it's also about the people that are in people's lives as well because we are influenced by each other yeah is that true y'all yeah. So she mentioned two things. One, she mentioned, first of all, the power of individuality, mm -hmm. that um, your husband is his own individual. Your wife, she's her own individual. Our children, they're their own individual. Our brothers, our sisters, they're their own individual. Mm -hmm. We can give them information. We can give them love and nurture. We can give them guidance. Mm -hmm. We can give them wisdom from our mistakes, mm -hmm. wisdom from our experiences. Yet, as an individual, right. they alone will determine how they use and what they do with that information. Yes, that's right. Indi they're individuals. Individual. Number two, lady mentioned they have other, this is tough, but right. they have other influences other than us. Yes. If you're married and that other person has friends, mm -hmm. those friends have influence. Oh, yes. Now, they only have as much influence right. as, you as your partner gives them. That's right. But they have influences yes. other than you who influence their perspective, yes. their behaviors. Mm -hmm. This is why we don't believe you should control right. who people are friends with, but if you's gonna be married to me, right. <laughs> yes. I need to be able to speak into mm -hmm. and give my input on people you are in relationship with that I know are ultimately and inevitably going to affect me. Because the Bible says this, 1 Corinthians 15, 33, be not deceived. Yes. Oh, yes. Come on. That's right. Bad company corrupts, corrupts good, people. 
Good character. Corruption doesn't happen immediately. It happens incrementally. When a battery becomes corrupt, right, it doesn't happen immediately. It happens incrementally. Amen? So people have other influences. Our children have other influences. Our, our, our spouses have other influences. Our siblings have other influences. And all of that contributes to the decisions that they make. They've got individuality, the power of influence, mm -hmm. and then also, first lady, the power of environments. That's right, because it's, it's not just about the people that you're around, but it's where you are, your environment. Um, I know I, I, we talk about now, our home needs to be a safe place, a place where we know we can just go and relax. And so I never understood environment until I understood this principle where I know I can go home and I can read my word and I can listen and I can, I can hear from God because it's not a chaotic place. It's a place that is serene to me. And so now I'm like, okay, my environment matters. So when I'm in certain environments and people are just all over the place and loud, I'm like, wait a minute, this is not my calm place. I gotta <laughs> find my environment again because environment matters. It does. I, I don't know if this is relating. I don't know if this is about to be relevant, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, no, I'm serious. Environment matters. Mm -hmm. Influences deal with people. Environments deal with spaces. Yes. Yes. You understand what we mean by that? Yes. And people, yes, people impact environments, but environments are also space. Right. So this is what, a, you know, um, the, the other day or something, I said, Brandon to the store, I said, Brandon, go get me a lighter. And he didn't ask me why, but I know he was wondering, Pastor, I don't know how to smoke anything. I, I don't even know how, you know. <laughs> I don't. Uh, but this is what happened. During my pastoral appreciation, someone gave me candles. And for some reason, I just put those candles on my desk. And uh, I, I had a lot of work I had to do this morning. And I'm telling y'all, I, I kept saying, those guys, I'm going to light those candles. Now, here I am, a grown man <laughs> in the office by myself. Well, I lit those candles. Listen. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm not, I'm not saying we should worship candles. I'm just, <laughs> I'm not telling you to go out and get some candles. I'm just saying that I don't know, just creating a space. Yes. The candles, it made my office feel different. Yes. Because environments matter. And so if someone is in a stressful, high-strung environment, brash environment, cutthroat environment, yes. it is going to affect the way they relate to family. That's the point we're making. So we're communicating, we're communicating these truths so that we understand our limitations. Right. But we do have responsibility. Mm -hmm. We do. So, so, so we know what we can't do. But what can we do? What, what do the scriptures communicate? What insight do they offer to us in terms of steps we can take mm -hmm. to navigate through our family matters and to make sure that family matters? And the first thing the scriptures teach us, this is really powerful. It's, it's simple, but I think it's powerful. And first lady, that is, number one, engage in intercession. Mm -hmm. It means pray for our families. Yes. Now, there's two types of prayer. Mm -hmm. We pray, we should pray offensively mm -hmm. and we should pray defensively. Yes. When I say pray offensively, what does that mean? It means that you pray that they prosper. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When, I pray, when I say pray defensively, what does that mean? It means you, we pray that they're protected. Mm -hmm. So if we have children, mm -hmm. are we praying offensively and defensively? Lord, prosper them. Give them favor in the classroom. Give them favor at college. Give them favor if they're, if they're in the military. Give them favor if they're, if they're living in another part of the, the country. Lord, give them favor, 
Favor according to Luke 2.52. You gave it to Jesus. Favor with God and with man. May they have favor with you and may they have favor with the people around them. May the favor be an usher that moves them in the right rooms. And may the favor be a bouncer that gets the wrong people out of their space. I, I, I want favor of God on them. Lord, I, are you hearing what I'm saying? Okay, you got, if, if children have a test, we're praying for favor. We're praying for favor over our husbands and our wives. Lord, I know they're not all they need to be in this area. And I'm frustrated by it and it's affecting me. But I just pray that you break the yokes, that you break the chains. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yes. Offensively. Yeah. But then also defensively. Because yeah. Lord, I know there's a target on them. Right. I know the enemy's got the wrong person um, in the apartment complex that my daughter lives in. I waiting on her to walk up the steps so he can de disrupt her life and detour her destiny. I, I, I know the enemy's got the wrong girl that he wants to bring to my son on the college campus to make him fall so crazy in love that he leaves school and gives up on his career. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Sickness and disease. You got little children and they're going into you know, schools and daycares. You got to pray right defensively. Lord, please don't, please don't let some person who may have some challenges take their anger out on my child because I don't want to have to go up to the school and lay hands on the sick and pray for them to recover. Lord, please. De pray deep. That's what we can do. Engage in intercession. Is that right, First Lady? And just not that even for our children with our spouses, protect their mind so that they can um, have peace and, and stay sane and, and not be attacked by the enemy and so they can stay focused on God. So you have to speak, pray all of those things, not just protection from what people are going to do, but mm. also for them. When mm. it talks about, um, you talked about it in the radical warfare where you put on the whole armor. Yes. So you got to start from the head all the way down. Right. Lord, protect their mind, protect their, their heart, their hands and their feet. That's right. All of All it. All of it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want the feet in the wrong place, the hands in the wrong place, the heart in the wrong place, right. or the head in the wrong place. Yes. I'm, all of that. All of it. That's right. Engage in intercession. That's what we can do. Number two, we can engage in instruction. Now, the way this works should work in the context of family, I think in any context, is that you want to use the opportunities that God presents to, gain, to, engage, in, to engage in instruction so that people don't feel like they have to switch relational hats with you when they're in the family. Right? Because even if my cousin is teaching me, I want my cousin to always feel like one. That's right. mm -hmm. Did you hear what I'm saying? So a cousin can be a teacher without compromising the reality of a relationship that a person might need to feel safe enough to expose things to you or to someone else that they wouldn't expose to someone that they didn't feel that comfortable with. Right. Do, do you understand what I mean by that? That really, um, I teach from the pulpit, right? Mm -hmm. But really, um, some of your greatest teachers aren't just gonna be people like me from the pulpit. Cause this stuff about you, I don't know. Right. But it's people we're in relationship with and we're like, you know what? I'm about to. Right. right? Nobody's coming to pass and say, you know what? I'm about to. <laughs> right. Because you only say I'm about to with people you feel safe with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And sometimes what happens is people have influence with people that they're in relationship with. And what happens is they take off the hat that gave them the influence and only keep on the instructor hat. Right. And then the person gets to the place where they no longer feel safe yeah. enough to expose the things that you want them to expose right. so you can give them the guidance that they actually need. I feel like I'm, y'all, y'all, either it's deep or y'all confused by the looks on your face. Either y'all thinking or you're confused. 
Okay, all right, I'll take the thinking. Yeah. And I think in the engage in instruction, because um, what I see even when you were explaining that, we have to make sure that we come on the person's level and we are not um, talking down to them and condescending, like we're instructing, trying to fix somebody or tell them what to do, but it's almost like a coach. You gotta get on the level with them. So if I'm in the gym and I have a coach, I need my coach to help me work out, but not tell me what to do. I need you to show me as well. So when the instruction piece, I really see somebody just kind of coming down on my level, sitting down, walking with me through it to give me instructions as well. Yeah, does it make sense? See, yeah, what she said, what she said, what she said, yeah. Because I know when, uh, I know this is the case for you also, when we both reflect on some of our experiences growing up, yes. some of our dominant influences in our family weren't our parents. Mm -hmm. Our parents had yes. dominant influence, right. had influence, but there were certain things we didn't expose our parents. Right. But there were, we had cousins. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. That we told, I'm about to. Right. <laughs> and they were like, no, hopefully. Right. You know, I mean, in my experience, they were, you know. Right. Yeah. Right, and that's why we want our families, if it's our children, if it's our spouses, we want them to feel comfortable enough to know that they're not going to be judged or really ridiculed, but they know that, okay, I can talk to you and you're going to help me through it. You're not going to yeah. come down on me for it. And when, I, and when I, I just thought of something, and the people who were probably the most influential in my life mm -hmm. don't know it yep. because I never told them. Right. You, are you are impacting people in ways right. you don't know. Because if they have not consciously came and told you, right. then you have no idea yeah. the influence that you have on people. That's good. There are two big cousins that, that come to my mind right now that were very, very influential. Mm -hmm. And I've never had a conversation with them and told them, you know what, growing up, I really looked up to you. That's right. That's good. Number three, and we're out. Is this good, everybody? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so, Engage in intercession, engage in instruction when opportunity presents itself. And then number three, last but not least, mm -hmm. um, understand that you're an example. Mm -hmm. right. That in the context of family, more is caught That's right. than is taught. That's right. That people are looking, people yeah. are watching and you have more influence than you know are you hearing what i'm saying if your spouse when it when it comes to parenting more is caught than is taught um when it comes to marriage more is caught than is taught you have more influence than you know your greatest impact is not in your instruction. It's in your example. This year we spent Thanksgiving with my pastor. And um, so I just kind of hung with him and shadowed him. And I've been to all types of conferences. I talk to him at least once a week and all that kind of stuff. I learned more probably hanging out with him in Thanksgiving than I have in everything else I've done with them combined. Because right. I just watched. Yes. I watched how he led his home. Mm -hmm. I watched how he famous, his children don't know it though. Mm -mm. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. He's famous, but his children don't feel like it. I watched that. Yeah. People are watching you. Some of you say, Pastor, I'm not even around my family. Well, Jesus said, who is my mother? Who is my father? The one who does the will of the father. So sometimes what God does is he gives you family. You just call them friends. Yeah. Some of your friends, that's your family. And for some of you, you have friends that are more like family than some of your family. So when we think family, I don't want you to think, because, you know, old, um, old and New Testament, right. like family wasn't this Western family union, unit, man, woman, boy, girl. Like right. family, it was a bunch of them in the house. That's right. Extended family. Mm -hmm. Amen? Yeah. I, 
First Lady, is something you want yeah, to say? Yeah, I think it's profound. Um, I was just thinking about when you said more is caught and then taught. A lot of us are praying for family members to just come to church and, and um, meet God. I hear people say, I'm praying for my husband, I'm praying for my son. And one of the things I thought about is, is the example piece, we have to really understand that we are an example. So if I'm saying that I'm a Christian and you know God is changing my life and he's using me, but if I'm at home and I'm not living that, I'm just saying it, then they're not going to want to do what I'm doing because they're going to think that it's not real. And so we have mm -hmm. to understand that we are truly examples. They're going to do what you do, and they're going to watch what you do. It's not about what you say, but it's what you actually do. Yeah. And once you've done, um, I, um, I was... Um, it may have been the sermon I did on release and regret. And I was talking about my son and some experience that I had. And I was getting ready to walk out the door that night. And uh, Taylor, one of the, um, a deacon here and who serves on security, uh, I was getting ready to walk out the door. He said, uh, now you know boys going to be boys. <laughs> you know, he's got this Billy D. Williams thing going on. And when he said that, it reminded me, it reminded me of, of, of something. And I think that's the heart of what we're, we're, we're kind of articulating tonight, right? In other words, the, I interpreted that as him saying, you're doing all right. It's going to be all right. Not as bad as you think. They'll come around. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? And I think sometimes in the middle of these seasons, we can overreact, we can, we can overreact on the outside, we can overreact internally when you do the best you can. They're gonna be all right. They're gonna come around. Amen? We're gonna get ready to go, but there's something on my heart to do tonight. And I wanna make sure I take the time to do it. I want to do it quickly, but it's on my heart to do. And that is, I, I want to pray for some of you who just in this season of your life, you may, some of you may feel like what other, whether it's, whether it's parenting, whether it's marriage, whether it's siblings, whether it's your parents, you're just in a season where you need a little impartation, meaning you have come to the end of yourself. I don't know what else to do. And Lord, I just need you to give me, to release to me the grace that is sufficient to navigate through some dynamics that are very complex for me right now. I just, I need you to help me. So I need you to release to me grace, that's ability, ability, God's unmerited favor and God's unmerited assistance. Release to me grace. Give me patience. I'm in a blended family. I need, I'm out of patience. I need you to give me some. Right? I'm trying to honor my mother and father, but it's challenging for me. And I'm out of strength. I need you to give me some. I'm fighting for this marriage. I don't know how much longer I can fight. I need grace. The Lord's going to give you grace tonight. He's going to release to you tonight. The Lord's going to make an impartation to you, meaning he's going to give you some of what he has to help you do what he's asking you to do. Because God never makes a request without offering assistance. We don't do obligatory altar calls here. So you should never feel guilty or oppressed to come if the request doesn't speak to you. We'll do enough of them that one day God will ring your doorbell. But for some of you, if God put this on my heart, and he did, you need this tonight. And if that's you, the Lord says you draw nigh to him, he draws nigh to you. If that's you, wherever you are in the room, really quickly, with no shame, I want you to come. I want you to meet me at this altar.
Well, listen, thank you for watching Thrive. I want you to make sure you subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss any of our teachings. And remember, you can watch me live at Thrive every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern.